basic instructions before leaving earth. This is Bible Radio, the internet radio ministry of Calvary Chapel St. Paul in Minnesota. And this is Sunday Morning Live. Calvary Chapel St. Paul is a non-denominational church dedicated to the teaching and living out of God's Word. And now, Sunday Morning Live. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Come on in. We're going to be in Galatians. Our, we start uh, Galatians, remember, Sunday, February 17th, is it? Church split, Remember. Split. Go find another church. If you can't and you're back here the following week, it's on you. Uh, go visit the other church plants, the other Calvary chapels around on that Sunday. And I think that's what our, this is our 17th, 18th annual church split. So if you're new here, uh, the rapture hasn't happened. It might have happened, but you won't know. We should be gone. But uh, uh, So that's, uh, again, in February. So look at our church calendar as well. And then we'll have a pre-recorded message on for Bible Radio. Turn within your Bibles to Galatians as uh, we continue our study uh, here. And uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. I ask you to be uh, Lord and lifted up and that uh, your will would be accomplished in our lives this morning. And so, Lord Jesus, just do that work in our lives. Uh, your word, as it tells us, doesn't come back void. So, Lord, I pray that... Uh, uh, just, everyone just gets blessed, Lord. I know that I am because uh, your word is amazing. And so, Lord, may we leave here today more on fire, more convicted, more committed, more submitted, more in love with you than when we came here uh, this morning in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, uh, the Apostle Paul, we studied through the Galatians here, uh, quite possibly could have... Uh, uh, walked uh, close to 10,000 miles, walked 10,000 miles uh, through uh, the various things. Uh, the back of your Bible should have some uh, pages stuck together. Those are your Bible maps, So, uh, but I've taken some pictures of mine. And you can see from where Paul is uh, traveling. His first missionary journey, Barnabas was pretty much the uh, lead. And uh, that's why in Acts chapter 13, uh, we read that it said as they were in there, uh, time of prayer, they said, uh, let us put together uh, this mission. So the Holy Spirit said it's good for us to send Barnabas and Saul uh, to go do the work of the ministry there. And so as you're looking through these slides here, uh, you can see the various uh, journeys that uh, they're taking and they're traveling around. But there's something when it comes to uh, this area of Galatia, it encompasses a lot. Uh, but what Paul's going to be dealing with here is the northern part in this slide here, the northern part of Galatia. He's going to be talking to the ethnic uh, Galatians. Uh, the Gauls had uh, in, invaded that area or taken over that area. And this letter was to be read to all the churches there. So there's going to be some specific things here, uh, some, some terminology that they're totally going to, going to get and that maybe uh, you and I won't, but that's why we come here. We study God's Word. And so for this morning, it's how then shall we live in today's world? I set you up last week, and hopefully uh, looking at this slide here, you did your homework, and you did. I was blessed by one of the young men here. His uh, grandpa gave him a pocket uh, declaration of independence and uh, the U.S. Constitution. And again, if you spent less than an hour reading through both of them, uh, You'll see that there's much scripture in there that doesn't say exact scripture, but you see plenty of references to God. And uh, before all these things, people say, well, you know, I just I don't like the whole political thing. I'm not making this political. I'm not making the Bible political. I'm not doing what they're doing. Uh, and right now it hasn't happened. But in the United States, hearing of a report uh, yesterday in Canada if any nonprofit or any church is to receive any funds from the government, which you shouldn't anyways, they have to sign a declaration that government is over religion, that government is greater than God. In Canada, you know, we really need to be protected from our northern border, right? But uh, in Canada, eh? And, and that's what's happening, and that's pretty much what's happening throughout Europe and through the European Union and all these things. So listen... Uh, the, so the many schools, Christian schools there that get, you know, whether the vouchers or they get school funding or from the government, they have to sign a declaration saying that government is greater than God. And so when you look at our United States Constitution, 
Uh, look at the very last words, the very last sentence there, saying that when it comes to all this, we pledge our sacred honors. Let me give you this right here. Um, when in the course of human events, this is uh, in Congress, July 4th, 1776, in, when in the course of human events, uh, it becomes necessary for, for one people to dissolve the political bands, uh, which, uh, again, keep them together. That's the very beginning of the Declaration of Independence. The very last sentence, these 56 signers were signing their death certificates to the British government. The British government, King George used this to hunt them down. Many of these men's wives were taken into slavery, were pillaged, their homes, their kids, everything. These 56 signers, that's why when we have this terminology, hey, put your John Hancock right here. Declaration of Independence. John Hancock was the first one to sign. He says, well, I don't want them to be guessing about me. And he just wrote it really big. And so that's why we say, put your signature here, put your John Hancock here. But look what they did here. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these things are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Listen, you only get to pursue happiness. There's no guarantee you're going to get it. And look at the very last sentence when it comes to this. And for the support of this declaration, we... Uh, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. That's our United States Constitution. That's the Declaration of Independence. That's, that's what they did. Folks, where did they get this idea? People say, well, you know, and again, last week when I'm showing you some stuff about uh, government of man and government of God and which we should be of, obviously we should be of the government of God. You say, well... Uh, you know, uh, I, I just don't like the whole political talk. Pastor Chick, you get too political and stuff like that. I'm not making this political. But you can read through the United States Constitution and you can read through the Declaration of Independence and you can see these men who were influenced by Weather Witherspoon. Did you look up and do your homework and look at the Black Regiment? The Black Robe Regiment. King George called all the preachers because they wore black robes and says these are the ones who are causing more sedition. They're causing more problems because people are reading the Bible. There was a, a church at one time that was pretty powerful throughout uh, uh, the whole known world based out of Rome right now. And they made it an edict to keep the Bible out of people's hands. When people read the Bible, they're liberated. Listen, all I need to know about your religion is how you treat women and children. And where dogs are on that. How you treat women and children. And so wherever Christianity is preached, when it's taught, when it's brought there, it liberates people. It, it gives people a written language. I have friends who are Bible translators. In fact, they go to known, un, people with no known language. They give them a written language. And so they, they can get the Bible into their hands. The U.S. House, uh, our House of Representatives, Congress used to be that's where they used to hold church in Washington, D.C. One of the very first books the Library of Congress ever printed was the Bible. And they passed it out. Many of people have that. So listen, where did they get these ideas that we're pledging our sacred honors to one another? We're doing these things. There already had to be something going on. You know, for me, I, I'm, I really benefited getting saved in Okinawa, Japan as a young Marine. I really benefited because there I went to church, not with just other Americans, but I went to church with other Ryukan Islanders, Okinawans. And the culture there is family. The culture there is saving face. The, the culture there is, is one of thinking of your neighbors. If you looked at that horrendous Fukushima, the, the tsunami that happened and the, and the nuclear power plant that was melted down, men had gone in there to turn things off and do things. And they know that was certain death. And unlike here in America, when there's uh, tragedies, hurricanes, storms, whatever, the, the grocery stores, looting, whatever, people are hoarding. They were showing people in Japan not taking all the water, and they're interviewing, why aren't you taking all the water? says, well, there's, there, I only need this much, and we've got to think of others. I benefited getting saved and, and growing up in the Lord early in my walk with the Lord there in Okinawa because I learned that communal living. I learned that which you pledge your sacred honor. I learned what it is 
that I left my wallet out somewhere at a, at a family park in Okinawa. When I came back from scuba diving, me and my buddies, some Okinawans, the family, the kids came, oh, you left these out. We wanted to make sure no one took these, and here you go. That's, everyone looked out for one another. I come back to the United States as a Christian. Whoa, Christianity a little bit different. But I, I choose not to live that way, so I am different. And you might ask around, and they'll even tell you, Pastor Chick, he ain't right. But... Uh, I benefited from that because of that culture and that lifestyle that fits really well with God's word. Where did these signers of the Declaration of Independence, where did these 13 colonies become 13 states? Where did they get these ideas? And then when you look through, I have led people to the Lord using the United States Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Where did they get this habit? Where did they, would we pledge our sacred honor to one another? Well, we're going to go through the book of Galatians. When you read about all the amendments, the first 10 amendments are known as the Bill of Rights. And you can go and you do your history, not History Channel history, not Wikipedia history. Go to the real uh, U.S. Constitution History Foundation and you'll find every one of those amendments, the first 10 of the Bill of Rights, where they came from and what pastors were speaking and influencing those senators and congressmen. And, and, and influencing them to write these things and where they're going to come up from and their deep conviction of these things. You see, where did, where did that come from? And I suppose it came because these people knew the word of God. They were going to church and they took just that which was, which was common, which was common in, in, in their day, and they applied that to God's word. You see, this is what we get to do and how we're going to live today for you and I in our lives, how we're going to live our lives out according to God's word. Hey, Jim, I need you to advance to the next slide till my uh, iPad reconnects there. Let's go to Galatians chapter 1. And Galatians, and if we're going to study that, I'm going to say it's the Declaration of Independence of Christian Liberty. Because many are going to come in and try to spy out this liberty. And that's what sometimes people do uh, when they look at church, they want to, well, how do you guys act? How do you guys function? What do you do here? How then should we live in today's world? Let's take God's word and apply it. No matter what the politics are, no matter who's in administration, no matter what's going on in your, your city, your state, uh, how do we live as believers? Listen, John chapter 17, verses 14 through 19. I have given them your word, and your word has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This is why we give a great place and importance to the teaching and living out of God's word here. Sanctify, the, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified, that they may be sanctified by the truth. Um, Galatians 1, Paul, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men. Need to underline that one there. But not of men, uh, not of man, of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. You have to go back to Acts chapter 9, Jesus again. Jesus led Paul to Jesus, <laughs> to Yeshua. He spoke to him there, there on that road to Damascus. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God our Father. This whole thing that he might deliver us from this present evil age. Well, okay, let's take scripture and have scripture interpret scripture. Jesus says, you're here. Someone says, man, I'm tired of being here. I don't want to be here. Why am I here? Because Jesus says he's not, he didn't come here to take you out of the world. He came here to sanctify you, to put you in the world. Listen, the greatest mission field you will ever enter is right through those doors as you leave here today. 
And I got to ask you, is this going to be a 50-50 message for you? 50 feet or 50 minutes, whichever comes first, it's done, it's over, it's gone. And so here, deliver us from this present evil age. The, 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 look at the corruption, the things that are happening around you in this world, this present evil age right now, but he's come to sanctify us through the word of God. Jesus, when tempted in the wilderness, what did he use? Well, the devil used scripture, but Jesus used it appropriately. Remember John chapter 17, verses 14 through 19. He's here to sanctify us through his truth and that word of God to get that in us. As we go through the Psalms on Thursdays, we'll be in Psalm. We get to Psalm 119, verse 11. Your word, O Lord, I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And here Paul comes to Galatians 1, 5. And to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. He gives them a salutation. He says, grace and peace unto you. Paul's changing culture, by the way. Totally changes things around. Because now he's not, because the whole thing is, you know, normally Jews uh, would say shalom, or uh, even in the whole uh, known world of the time, people would say, peace be unto you. Common phrase. Paul changed it. It's a conversation thing. I like when I I meet people and and I just say, hey, how the heaven are you? And they go, that's not what we normally, it, it, it stops them. How the heaven are you? That's right, bless you. Go to heaven. That's right, bless you. And they're like, uh, that's different. You call me, I answer my phone. Praise the Lord. Anyone can say, hey, you know, hello, you know. Uh, you can do whatever, but no, I'm just, then you know it's a bill collector. Uh, 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 and then you start evangelizing. It starts, he says, grace, you first Paul takes a normal salutation, grace and peace unto you. Hey, Paul, why why are you saying grace? Well, you first must receive the grace of God before you'll ever get his peace. Man, can't you just say you're fine? Just say fine and, you know, peace be unto you and, you know, uh, sneeze and we say God bless you, all that kind of, uh, can't you just do that? No, grace and peace unto you. Look at verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from, uh, from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is, which is not another gospel. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So here's missing uh, what Paul does in some of his other letters. This lets you know how serious it is. Like in, in Romans and 1 Corinthians and Philippians, and we can see in Colossians, he gives this, again, that grace and peace unto you. And hey, you know, praise the Lord, how things are going. I love you, miss you, all that kind of stuff. No, he's marveling at that. There's something missing. He's letting you know there's something important going on here. When they first came through Galatia, he was, it was Barnabas and Saul. Later, it's now Paul's leading the ministry, and he's doing those things. And, and he's addressing them. That you're so soon, really that soon, that you would, you would leave that which you were called to? I marvel that you remove, that you're turning away from those things. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That's anathemized. Let him be condemned to hell. Anathemized. Let him be obliterated there. Let him be, this, this is strong language. He says, another gospel. And there's some perversion going on because it's not like the different of a same kind. It's, he's saying it's totally, totally opposite, totally foreign to all this. And as we said before, so say now, I, say, I, I now again, if any man preach another gospel unto you uh, than that ye have received, let him be accursed, anathemized. Verse 10, for I do not persuade men or God or do I seek to please men? For, I, uh, for if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Jesus Christ. Listen, uh, it's apparently something else is going on here. This, this difference here is um, a different, not just of the same kind. You know, similar but different. You know, we're on the line. Like, you know, evangelical or, or Baptist or fundamentalist Baptist. I mean, we're evangelical. We believe in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is something totally different. And this is before, again, you might come to mind 
of thinking of the Mormons because they believe the angel Moroni uh, gave Joseph Smith these golden spectacles and, uh, you know, he's able to get the tablets, these old ancient Egyptian script, and he got the Book of Mormon and of an angel. Well, this is before the Mormons ever even existed, folks. He says, but again, others are coming and they're saying by revelation. That's why I say be careful of that book, Jesus Calling. Uh, that woman is re- receiving messages that she believes is superseding the word of God. And so be careful of that devotional uh, out there because Jesus Calling. Just be, when I say be careful, uh, get rid of it. Uh, put it on a shelf or hold it and be able to where you can show it. Because she clearly says in the forward where all these messages are coming from. And so here there's something, to- it's, it's not of the same thing. It's something totally different here. He tells us here, for I did not persuade men, and I'm not a man pleaser. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my conversation in times past. This is an, this is an antiquated King James term. Conversation means your whole manner of life. It's sort of where I like the, where the NIV gets it right, where it interprets it and says the whole manner of life. Yeah, he's not just talking about the spoken word. This word conversation means your whole manner of life. You know everything about me. So for you have, received, uh, for you have heard of my uh, conversation in times past in the Jews' religion and how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it putting people to death, having letters from the Pharisees, from the scribes and Sadducees, the religious elite, from the Sanhedrin to go and to to take the apostate Jews. And look at verse 14. As I said last week, follow the money. Just, you have a suspicion of anything? Just follow the money, man. Just follow the money. It says, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Do you know about the Apostle Paul putting people to death? He was there at the stoning of Stephen. It says, uh, if you remember the statement, Jesus said, who's ever without sin, cast the first stone. The thing was, the ones who were bringing about the death penalty, the witnesses had to cast the first stones. It says there at the end of Acts chapter 7 that there was Saul giving witness to this, protecting everyone's clothing, because the thing happened when a good stoning was going on, you took your cloaks off and did those things, and, and then other unscrupulous people uh, would come by and take your belongings. So whoever was the first witness, whoever cast the first stone, they would go and watch everyone else's stuff. And so here's the Apostle Paul putting Stephen, one of the first deacons, to death. And, and he says, I, I'm, that, that zealousness. And then he goes on to tell us about being a servant. It, now this word is bond slave. It, it's slave, this bond slave. That it, you, you don't speak for yourself. This word bond slave is as the King James, again, translated servant, but it's where we get bond slave, that, that you don't speak for yourself. You, you have no say in any of these things. And that's what Paul is saying. I'm that bond slave of Jesus Christ. For I do not persuade men, uh, for I do not persuade men of God uh, or God. I do not seek to please men Again, making this contrast of himself and others that it seems that others are bringing you another gospel because of what? Because they're trying to please people. This gospel literally means, that's what the word means, good news. And he's telling them this gospel, this other gospel, it's not, it's bad news. You got other people telling you things and it's bad news. This is something totally different. Not of the same kind, not a new nuance there. And he says, let it to be, let it be, let it be. Now, last week, and this, this week it's been, uh, well, every week's interesting for me, so, um, but last week I showed you this. This is my new Enhance ID, okay? And, you know, it was brought to my attention that this could be offensive to, again, uh, and I want to put in context of why. And there was some frustration going on because of I was seeing others with other headgears with Sikhs or, or Muslims or my Jewish friends, and they're getting their head coverings with their IDs. And I'm like, I thought you had to take glasses off and hats off. And so I said, well, I'm just going to go. I'm, this, is my, this is my belief. I want my, I want my hat on. I don't want to give you the context there, but again, it could be taken. And, I, and someone approached me and said, you know, this, listen, you know, Muslims can not understand the context there. And so I want to show you this. 
and give you some context of, uh, of why and to understand. And again, I've talked with some of my other Muslim friends and began to really ruminate over these things. Uh, how would m some of my Muslim friends uh, take this as well? And again, I've talked with them. But let me give you this uh, video here that you might uh, understand some things here. For every opinion or belief someone may hold, there will be another party who just as strongly opposed that idea. Both sides usually claim to sit with the best arguments, the real facts, and the correct worldview, and ironically, both sides regard the other as being indoctrinated, blind to the obvious and outright stupid. Most people only expose themselves to information that matches their own worldview. It is uncomfortable to do otherwise. Still, we would like to give you some surprising information about Islam. We also urge you to look further than only mainstream media, and if you can find the time for it, read the Quran yourself. To get you started, we'd like to present you three things you probably did not know about Islam. 1. Islam has not been hijacked. That Islam has been hijacked is what non-Muslims naturally assume, because they assume all religions are the same. The reason non-Muslims are so easily confused is that most of us don't realize the difference between the Quran and every other religious book we are familiar with. The Christian Bible is a collection of writings from various authors, written sometimes hundreds of years apart, with parables, advice and dreams, all collected together into one book. Same with the Jewish Torah. Even those of us in the West, who are neither Christians nor Jews, are still familiar enough with these religions to know this much and therefore we assume the same is true for the Quran. But the Quran is only one book written by one man in his own lifetime. It is meant to be taken literally and it is not full of symbolism or vague analogies. It is mostly direct commands. Of course, the Quran contains contradictory statements just like other religious books, but the Quran itself provides the reader with a way to know what to do with the contradictions. It's explained in the Quran that if you have two passages that contradict each other, the one written later supersedes the one written earlier. Most Westerners are unaware that the peaceful, tolerant passages were written early in Muhammad's prophetic career. According to the Quran, those passages have been abrogated by later, more violent and less tolerant passages. So, when most Westerners hear jihadists quoting violent passages from the Quran, and then peaceful Muslims quoting peaceful passages, they interpret that the way they would if someone was quoting the Bible or the Torah. They think to themselves, oh, there must be many different and contradictory passages, like there are in other religious books, so Muslims can pick and choose what they like and justify whatever actions they want to take. But the Quran is nothing like that. There is no picking and choosing. It says very explicitly and in no uncertain terms that a Muslim must not alter or ignore any part of its very clear and direct message, or they will burn in a fiery torment forever. Two, striving to institute worldwide Sharia law is a religious duty. Many people don't realize how politically oriented Islam is at its core. In fact, Islam is less of a religion than it is a religious ideology. It includes a mandatory and highly specific legal and political plan for the whole society, Sharia. There is no separation between the religious and the political in Islam. Rather, Islam and Sharia constitute a totalitarian means of ordering society at every level, including ritual worship, transactions and contracts, morals and manners, beliefs and punishments. In the Quran, Allah makes it clear that man-made governments such as a democracy and free speech such as criticizing the Quran are abominations and must be eliminated. The modern expression creeping Sharia is used to describe the slow, deliberate and methodical advance of Islamic law in non-Muslim countries. Official Sharia courts already operate in the UK, handling cases ranging from divorce and financial disputes to domestic violence. Attempts to introduce Sharia in the legal system in Germany, Sweden and other European countries are ongoing. 
while Sharia already has a foot in our door in the matter of minor disputes like inheritance and domestic violence, it should concern you that Sharia commands that drinkers and gamblers should be whipped, allows husbands to hit their wives, allows an injured plaintiff to exact legal revenge, literally an eye for an eye, commands that a thief must have a hand cut off, commands that homosexuals must be executed, orders unmarried fornicators to be whipped and adulterers to be stoned to death, orders death for both Muslim and non-Muslim critics of Muhammad, the Quran and even Sharia itself, orders apostates to be killed, commands offensive, aggressive and unjust jihad. As written in the Quran, Sharia is the law of Allah. Any other form of government is a sin. It is the duty of every Muslim to keep striving until all governments have been converted to Sharia law. Three, Muslims are allowed to deceive non-Muslims if it helps Islam. For non-Muslims, this principle called taqiyya is another surprising concept of Islam. While most other religions speak highly of truthfulness, the Quran instructs Muslims to lie to non-Muslims about their beliefs and their political ambitions to protect and spread Islam. There are many examples of today's Islamic leaders saying one thing in English for the Western press and then saying something entirely different to their own followers in Arabic a few days later. Deceiving the enemy is always useful in war and Islam is at war with the non-Islamic world until the whole world follows Sharia law. All non-Muslims living in non-Islamic states are therefore enemies. So deceiving Westerners is totally acceptable, even encouraged, if it can forward the goals of the spread of Islam. As a recent example, the Islamic American Relief Agency was seemingly raising money for orphans, but in fact giving the money to terrorists. They deceived good-hearted Western infidels into giving money to organizations that were actively killing Western infidels. Do the research yourself. This is not an isolated case. Islam as a religion of peace. Muslim organizations worldwide often declare that Islam is a religion of peace. But what does that really mean? It seems easy for a Muslim to quote a peaceful verse from the early parts of the Quran, while, by following the principle of taqiyya, neglecting to mention the fact that it has been officially abrogated by later, more violent verses. According to the Quran, the world will be at peace only when Islam and Sharia reign in every country, and never until then. This is why every Muslim can truthfully say that Islam is a religion of peace. If any of these points took you by surprise, then there is surely much more you still don't know. This subject will affect you in the near future, so take the chance to inform yourself now before it does. This was done in 2010, and it was not a Christian organization doing this, and they were, they'd know that. So again, when they say there's contradictions in the Bible, there's not. But that's how many people think, well, there's a lot of contradictions in the Bible. If anyone ever gives you that, say, well, show me one. And there are no contradictions in the Bible. God's word written over 1,500 year time span by 40 different authors in three different continents and three different languages. And it's all uniform and it's all say is the same thing. The same redeeming message, God redeeming man. Every book of the Bible, you see the signature of the Holy Ghost all the way through. I vetted all this. You can vet it yourself. I have uh, over a dozen Muslim friends in Kuwait, Egypt, Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, Iraq. Um, and before I showed any of this years ago, I made sure this is all vetted, and it is. They said it's exact, that's exactly what it is. My friends that I met from part of the, the Crown Prince's family there in Kuwait uh, took me in and, and uh, began to give me the uh, the inside scoop of what's happening there in the Middle East. And says, there'll be no peace in the Middle East. And it said the same thing, follow the money. We got so much money. We, we steal from one another. We do one of the, the, these are the things that we do. And so uh, there won't be any peace in the Middle East. And he was, as he said, Muslim light. I, I give you this. We put a conference on um, 
in 2017, a Cry for Awakening conference, and we had Elijah Abraham here. I'm going to be rebroadcasting these, the, these on, on Bible radio, but you can go to the Man Up Show, manupshow.org. Uh, Bernie's got these on the website there uh, of all 15 sessions. Um, and what got me thinking about, it was the frustration of, of seeing all these things and uh, why I wanted my picture taken, new enhanced ID, planned it for a while, and it just came to a lot of frustration. Something else happened this week. I was frustrated about something else. I get an email from, uh, uh, from somebody, not here in church, a non-believer in another organization, and said, well, you know, you, you seem very uh, brisk, was the word that they used with me. And it seems like I took out my frustration on another uh, member of my former team. And I was like, uh, yeah. You're, I, I can be that way. It's just that frustration. And so I don't want to misrepresent, I don't want to misrepresent Christianity. I don't want to misrepresent my view. That enhanced photo ID came from just being frustrated from seeing all these things here. Here's the underlying thing. My friends, my Muslim friends, and we've led quite a few Muslims to the Lord. My Muslim friends are sincerely deceived. They're God seekers. And every one of them know under the weight of the Quran. If you've been following Fighting for Truth with Rick Bowden on our radio show, you know he spent that whole year reading the Quran on air and going over those things. I've read the Quran. Uh, these things are true, written by one man, and you just do your own study. This is a religion that's another, what they would say a gospel is a good, is a good news. They're using a different word. They're using a different thing. They, they recognize Jesus as maybe a prophet, as a good man, I would ask you to go to livingoasis.org, livingoasis.org. That's Elijah Abraham's website. We can't show you any pictures because he's had to move. Him and his family had to move a few times. If you remember his testimony, he came out of Iraq. Uh, he is Muslim, and it's really how he was mistreated by his other Muslims in the U.K. and then finally here in America that finally had him turn to Christianity. He goes, this is this, Muslims. And there's a lot, of, not all Muslims are the same. It's the same problem that America made years ago, thinking Native Americans, First Nation, Indians, my day we called them Indians, were all the same. But the Inuit, the Blackfoot, the Crow, the Navajo, the Apache, they all didn't get along. And in, in the sad case in America's history, when we put them all on one reservation, so you can have all this, we don't all get along. It's the same way in Islam. There's Wahhabianism, there's Baathist, there's Shi'i, there's Sunni. There's all different types when it comes to Islam, and they're all warring with one another. You know, not just that, but you can go to our website and our belief section, and you can get some of the papers that we've written on either in Islam or Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness. I was raised as a Christian scientist, so I can give you that. That, that is bad news. It's, a, it's another gospel. It's not, it's not the similar of the same kind. It's just little nuances. And if you just think, well, all roads, you know, you have that Star Trek version, you know, all, you know, many faces, one voice, you know, the new frontier, that's old Star Trek, by the way. Uh, you, you have all that, and you just think, and that's, you start applying what we do when it comes to the Bible. And as I said last year, or last week, President Jefferson, the third president of the United States, that whole separation of church and state came from a letter he wrote a certain Baptist group, because it, it sounded like they were going to make a, a state religion, which they left, which the whole American Revolution, that's one of the reasons why they declared the Declaration of Independence. The King of England, King George, was over the church. He was the head of the church in England. He said, no, we're not going to make a state religion. We're not going to make a state religion. And he said, I want to assure you, there's a great wall of separation between church and everyone. The government's not to get into that. And that became what? The First Amendment. Government shall not establish any religion and not, again, give the free, you know, prohibit the free exercise. Here's our belief section, everything we're about. If you have a certain topic you'd like to know about, we'll put a paper together, we'll put it on there. This is a working website for you to go to. You can find out everything about us. And there's nothing hidden here. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me, by his grace, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia 
and returned again unto Damascus. Now, this part of Arabia is not what we would consider modern-day Saudi Arabia right now. This is the northern and western or eastern part of where we see Syria right now. That All that area was called Arabia. He says, and I returned unto Damascus. When you read through the book of Acts, it, it, it seems like Paul got saved one day, got smuggled, got blinded, and eyes came to him, got his sight back. The next day he got lowered out of a basket, and then boom, he's in Jerusalem. No, he came there a few years later, about three years later. Uh, and so he says here, and then I returned unto Damascus, and that's that whole account of, uh, of him being lowered in a basket out of out inside of the wall there. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. He wasn't commanded to go there, but I went to see Peter. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Jesus' own brother got saved. Remember James, one of the first deacons, uh, uh, Stephen, one of the first deacons to get martyred. And then we know that James uh, was an apostle that was martyred. But James, who wrote the book of James, we know him to be the Lord's brother. And Jude, by the way, saying, hey, listen, I, I didn't even believe my brother. I didn't even believe that Jesus was the Messiah. You see, verse 20. Now, these things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. Why does he have to say that? Because they say, you're a liar, you're this, you're that. Afterwards, I came into the regions of uh, Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they, uh, they had heard only that 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 he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he tried to destroy. Again, look at Galatia there. Look on the map there. You can see the various areas that he came into. Uh, you can see the various things that he came into and what he did. And the area that, that's the area that he's talking about there. Back to verse 20. Uh, but he says here, And I was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ, but they heard that, heard only that, that he that which uh, persecuted us in times past now preacheth faith, which was once he destroyed. Remember, Paul says how zealous I was. He even talks about himself in Philippians, says, I was, you know, they're, they're a Jew. I'm more of a Jew. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I this. And he, we finished up 2 Corinthians where he gives his resume and he just talks about how, how he persecuted zealously. Well, it was foretold about. Here's a quick little video for you. This was even told about when it comes to those who say they'd be doing this in the name of God. It was the Lord Jesus himself that predicted that before he returned, families would betray one another and friends would be divided. This verse is Luke 21, verse 16. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives, and friends, they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated for my namesake. It was the Lord Jesus who said, I came to bring a sword, not peace. Most believers think that peace and safety will never leave their family. It will never leave their fellowship. But the Lord Jesus himself is the one that predicted that before he comes back, family will betray one another. It is also written that those who think that they are serving God will kill true believers, and they think that they're offering God a service. In John chapter 16, verse 2, it says, They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think he offers God a service. These are signs that will happen before the return of Jesus, and Jesus is not returning in favor. He is not returning in the favor of people on this earth. He is returning in judgment. It's not a pretty sight. Which side will you be on? Are you persecuted with Jesus? Or do you have the blood of the saints on your hands? May the grace of Jesus be with you. Paul, who formerly persecuted the church. Now listen, 
I'm going to be re-airing those on my uh, Chick Chickellis Hour and on Bible Radio on our program this week, all 15 sessions, so for the next 15 weeks, but you can go to manupshow.org and uh, you can listen to the podcast. You can listen to them, those sessions there. They're just audio. But just as I know that my friends who are Muslims are sincerely deceived, so are my Mo Mormon friends and my Jehovah's Witness friends and my Christian Science family and all these other New Agers. But unlike unlike those religions that are a false gospel, which are not the gospel of good news at all, same thing for us. For, for you and I, when we go to the parks, because we meet Thursdays uh, during the summer at Como Park, and we have a very large uh, Muslim population that comes. The, the moms come because they just tell their husbands they're going to the park with the kids, and they sit up on the hill, and that's why we amplify. And their kids are able to join our kids in the discovering God's path, and they're able to do those things. And, and, and some of you were there a couple of years ago when one uh, Somali husband found out that, his, that they, she was actually listening to this church service, and he beat her. And they grabbed their kids right out of it. And, and there's nothing that we could do because here in the city of St. Paul, they said, well, he was beating his wife. and said, well, that's a cultural thing. That's a... That's a religious thing. We don't want to get political about it. Did absolutely nothing. And you and I as guys are like, oh, you weren't there that day, Rick. But, uh, oh, you know. But yet they said, well, that's their religion. They, they, they can do that. The rule of thumb, you ever said, oh, that's just a rule of thumb. That comes from the Quran. It says that you can only beat your wife with no, th nothing, no thicker than your thumb. And they, they have that. But if someone does come to Christ, who, from the Muslim, you and I as a fellowship need to be prepared to take them in. And there's many that go back because all they know are, is Islam and they know that and that's the culture and that's the family that they're in. You see, we have to be sensitive when it comes to that. And I think that's where me taking that picture, I was insensitive about that. But that frustration come off. But we have to be prepared as a fellowship, especially this summer. Many more of those moms come. Remember, women with the women, men with the men. And and the kids, they, they have a great time. But for someone to receive Jesus Christ as Savior Lord doesn't necessarily mean that they can leave. Listen, for me becoming a Christian, I got, I've been called a few names, been punched a few times. That's all I've ever suffered, being a Christian. And my family, Christian Science, thinking I'm just a weirdo or a nut. But the same thing. But yet, let's look at the Mormon history. Avenging Angels, right, Rick? This is Rick Bud. They used to have a group called the Avenging Angels, part of the Mormon church that went and tracked down apostate uh, Mormons and killed them. So I just need to know your religion. So this is the thing. Wherever Christianity is truly preached and taught, it brings liberty. You see, Paul talks about his status of being unknown. And he's okay to be unknown. You know, the unfortunate thing is that you can see uh, within the last 30, 40 years, especially from the 70s on, did you know Bob Dylan got saved? I've got audio of him preaching. I've got audio of him on radio shows defending the gospel. You can go to YouTube and see where he got booed off the stage when he was trying to play all this Christian music and everyone wanted to hear Route 66 and they wanted to hear, you know, everybody must get stoned. And he said, I don't do that anymore. And he got booed off. There's something that happens in, in Mark Farner from Grand Funk Railroad. I'm really dating myself here. When he got saved, uh, a Christian label says, oh, you got to start popularizing your name right now while, you, while Grand Funk Railroad is still known, and you can do that. And another Christian musician says, well, you can do that, or you can get in the Word of God. And he basically fell off the scene there, became a, got, you know, grew in a relationship with the Lord, became a youth pastor, and and now he's out touring now with a remake version of Grand Funk Railroad. And when he sings Some Kind of Wonderful, he throws the words Jesus in there and he, he starts evangelizing people. You can see these things. So Paul was okay to be unknown. They didn't need to have him there. But yet you and I, just because someone's a star in the world doesn't necessarily mean that they'll be a star. Can I tell you who makes the worst, the worst children's ministry teachers? Teachers. Public, private tutors, whatever, because that's the mindset. That's what they have. And the kids aren't coming to our children's ministry. They want a class to have school. And so those are it. You know who makes the worst uh, singers when it comes to a worship team? Professionals. They have the hardest times because we slur our words. You know, I love your grace. I love your mercy. But you know, I love your presence most of all. The guy who actually wrote that song came to church here. He's a friend of mine. But the way that we sang it, he's just like, he had problems with it because we say, but you know. 
But you know, I love your grace most of all. I mean, the words are, it says right up on the screen. That's why we don't put words up on the screen and we just teach you the words. But when you put the words up on the screen, and he's like, it says right there, but you know, I love your presence most of all. But you know, eh? You know how we do it here, right? You know what I mean? And so listen, you can sometimes, just because someone's famous in the world doesn't necessarily they're going to be famous in Christianity. Listen, Paul talks and says, Now these things which I wrote unto you, behold, before God I lied not. Afterwards I came unto you in the regions of Cilicia and Syria. And look what he says here. He says that they glorified God. Ask yourself the question, are they glorifying God? Can we as the believers, can we do for the truth what the cults do for a lie? I don't think we should go out and kill anybody. And that's not what I'm saying about doing for the church. I'm talking about the zealousness. There's people who show up in their gang colors and ride bikes and they show up at your door and they want to give you tracks and various things. Are we willing to do for the truth with the cults do for life? Can we even do, look what the signers of the Declaration of Independence and for this support of this declaration. Can we say that as believers? I would hope so because that's our goal with Home Fellowship. You can go to our website and you can see what it talks about. How do we live these things out? Because we get in together in smaller groups. We come here, we learn the Word of God. We come here as a congregation and come together. But you can get involved in home fellowships. And they're based on Acts chapter 2, verses 42 on. That devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread, to prayer, to, to ministering to one another. That when the world around us sees us and how we, how we are ministering to one another, how we're taking care of the needs of one another, we can do those things. You know, our home fellowships, you know, when we're born again, but what do we do? If, if you just come to church on Sundays and maybe, or Sundays and Thursdays, you're getting, you're getting a lot, but there's got to be a community. That's why we put a whole lot into having bad coffee and really good pastries here. All right? That's why, Johnny, you try your best there, but, you know, that would do it. Right? You work with what you have there, all right? And so, but, you know, we get Dale pastries from, uh, from a pastry shop, and, and we get them. This stuff's great. And we come and we can fellowship. You know, you can come on Thursdays. We have a community supper here. Just bring something to share. we got a kitchen downstairs. I cooked up steaks this last week. They're pretty good, all right? So we do this. Come and fellowship at 530. And you come here and, 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 and trying to do all that we can do to come together as a community. But home fellowships is where it's really at. And again, I just have you to go to our website and, and uh, check these visions out for yourself. The home fellowship is an extension. Let me just give you this of the of the main church body, just as it was the, as in the early church. Our method is to follow the leading of the apostles in the early church. Again, that's why I'm saying, that's why I'm grateful I got saved in Okinawa, Japan, because that was all communal language. Everyone was taking care of one another. And so uh, for those people to come in to become Christians and stuff, they just picked up right where they left off. They were able to continue on and do those things. But to get together, hey, are you shocked and surprised? Because I'd still do. When the doorbell rings, do you even know you have a doorbell? When someone knocks at the door, who's that? In my day, we called it company. <laughs> but they didn't call first. No. Just be normal people. See me walking up there, turn the lights off, close the curtains, and crouch down. Because you know I'm going to look through the windows. All right? And you just, just, just call. What is that? What is this? You know, ding, dong, ding. Whatever. It's just, it's, it's called company. It's called, that's just showing up. You see, when we understand how offensive the true gospel can be, and it has to be, if you look at all these other things, all these other religions, they're they're probably not as offensive. But it's true when it comes to our human nature. And so again, I leave you with this. There's three things. The gospel offends our pride. It tells us that we need a savior. Second, the gospel offends our, our wisdom. That's a lot when I came from the cults, uh, the Christian science is a cult, metaphysical, and the whole mind science thing. It's Christian science. It's like a bowl of grape nuts. It's neither Christian nor science. It's neither grape nor nuts, all right? So that's what it is. And so the gospel defends our wisdom. It saves us by something, uh, again, it saves us by something many consider foolish, God rising from the dead. And third, the gospel defends our knowledge. It tells us to believe in something that's not scientific. Really? Can you make an eyeball? Can you make a blade of grass? Look at, as a, again, reading through the, the Bible again, and just starting off with Genesis and look at, Genesis and look at the whole creation issue. Can, can you? Can you? So the gospel offends our pride. It offends, it offends my pride. That's why I stayed away for so long. It offends the wisdom. And thirdly, it, the gospel offends our knowledge. Those three things will never change. 
Maybe you've been a Christian for a while, you forgot what it was like to be prideful and full of your own wisdom and have your own knowledge and do those things. But that's how we, again, approach and are approached. How then shall we live? I'm not making any of this political. I'm not making any of this the, the law of the land. And then when you look at the United States Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, just read it today. Get a copy of it. Man, I used to hand them out to everybody. I just ran out of copies. And it's right online. You can read it. And then go just for the first 10 especially, the amendments, Bill of Rights. Who's influencing those? Where did that language come from? Why did they craft it a certain way? What happened? And so you can find that black robe regiment and those preachers in the pulpits who taught the word of God. And that's why King George wanted to imprison pastors. It's, it's happening throughout the rest of the world. And we already know it's happening in Canada that the government has to, you have to sign a paper, government is above religion, above God, if you want to receive any funds from it. Well, we don't receive any funds. How then shall we live? So we study through the letter to the Galatians. How do we live these things out? I don't want to be frustrated and present a frustrated God or a relationship with the Lord. I can do that, so forgive me for that. But for you and I, let us take the word of God and apply it to our lives. Lord Jesus, thank you for today. I ask you to be Lord and lifted up that you, Jesus, would just do the work in each and every one of our lives this morning. That we fall more in love with you. Than you. Praise the Lord. My prayer is that you've been blessed with this Sunday morning live broadcast. Remember, you can tune in each Sunday morning at 1040 a.m. Central Standard Time or to our Thursday night live broadcast, which is at 735 p.m. each Thursday night as well. So that's Sundays at 1040 a.m. and Thursday nights at 7.35 p.m. Central Standard Time. You can also listen to the Chick Chick Ellis Hour. That's with me live Wednesdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Central Standard Time. Our Sunday morning live, our Thursday night live, the Chick Chick Ellis Hour is all rebroadcast throughout the week. The information is on our webpage that you can uh, check that out as well. Also, on Saturdays from 3 to 4 p.m. is the Fighting for Truth with Rick Bowden. That can be heard live there as well, 3 to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. All these broadcasts are continually rebroadcast throughout the week for your listening pleasure, but for you mostly to get fed the Word of God. Will you read ahead, pray ahead, study ahead for next week, find out what the Holy Spirit will do in your life? The Word of God is right there for you, folks. So until next week, may the Lord richly bless your day.